Well, we've come to the final week of our awesome August speakers, and uh, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce to you today uh, my friend, Dennis Brant. I've known Dennis for over 34 years. He was a pastor in uh, Florida when I became a pastor many, many years ago, and uh, he actually went to the Mandarin Christian Church when it was a church of 125, grew it into the largest Christian church in the state of Florida, uh, averaging almost 4,700 uh, every Sunday morning. Today it's known as Christ Church of Jacksonville. It's even larger than that. Uh, Dennis has been a tremendous leader, a wonderful example. He's a great preacher. He's a wonderful people person. And uh, I looked up to him as a young pastor. We became uh, friends. He came and spoke at our church. And uh, I have to tell you, in the last year since he retired, uh, he now serves on the board with us at the Solomon Foundation. He's also one of our missionaries to the CORE Foundation. And uh, it's been a joy for me to reconnect with Dennis and to get to become a golf buddy with him and get to golf uh, in several areas around the country we get to go to. So on this final weekend of our awesome August speakers, I want you to give the greatest welcome you've ever given a warm Crossroads Christian Church welcome to my dear friend, uh, Dennis Bratton. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. I, <clears throat> this has to be the most gracious church I've ever been a part of in my life. And I say that as honestly as I can say it. You guys are incredible. Uh, turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I've got a little bit of a problem. They told me to look at that clock on the back wall. My eyes are so bad I can't see it, so we're all in trouble today. So somebody wave at me about the time I'm supposed to stop. I love fine dining, don't you? I love great restaurants. I like restaurants where I go in and I feel comfortable. They're consistent, whether you're in Tennessee where I live or Florida where I used to live or Texas where we are now. And one of my favorites is like that. Any place you go, the wait staff is always about the same. The short order cooks are always dependable. It's comfortable, consistent, same gritty floors, greasy tables, syrup sticks to your britches, and you know they use real eggs because there's a little bit of shell in every omelet they deliver to your table. I'm talking about Waffle House. Anybody else? <laughs> Fine dining at Waffle House. You get a slice of life at Waffle House you don't get any place else. If you like to watch people, go to Waffle House. The food's okay. The people watching is kind of incredible. And preachers get an awful lot of sermon material at Waffle House. <laughs> I was there years and years ago at my favorite in Jacksonville, Florida, and a fellow walked in that looked kind of unusual, and he had a t-shirt on, and it's the first I remember of seeing that little cartoon character that's kind of back this way, but he's strutting forward, got his foot shot out, and the, the, the logo underneath says, keep on trucking. Have you seen that before? I remember seeing that and thinking at the time, what a great sermon idea that is. I was thinking about what I was going to say to you today, and I thought, you know, that kept coming to my mind, keep on trucking. I live in Tennessee now, and it seems appropriate there. I'm not sure about Texas, but it seemed appropriate. And I began to Google search, keep on trucking. I found some spiritual connections to that little character. I found one guy that uh, copyrighted a t-shirt that has the picture of the guy and Psalm 34, 8 underneath it. Well, I turned to Psalm 34, 8, and sure enough, it says, I will praise you at all time. And then he begins to talk about what he's living at that time. He's afflicted, fears, shame, troubles, poverty. And yet I'm going to praise you at all times. Why? Because verse 8 says, I've tasted, I've seen that the Lord is good. So I can keep on trucking because the Lord is good. You're skeptical? Turn over to Psalm chapter 141. I found something else. It's right there on the internet. It's talking about a guy who's uh, praying. And in his prayer, he says, Lord, I've got all kinds of problems. I can't control my tongue. I, I get involved in wicked things. I do evil things. I'm afraid of death and being accountable for that. He is really struggling but then he says in verse 2, but I'm going to send prayers to you like incense. I'm going to lift my hands and reach for you, God. I'm going to keep on trucking. And you know that there is an official keep on trucking incense burner that you can buy today. There's a picture of it. <laughs> I tried to buy one of those for your preacher and leave it as a gift, but 
they're back ordered. <laughs> so thinking about what I wanted to say to you today, I, I want to forgive me for being so common, but I want to say to you, Christians, keep on trucking. And I think there's encouragement from Hebrews chapter 12, beginning verse 1. Read it with me and listen to what this Hebrew writer is saying to encourage the people of that day, and I think it's encouragement for today. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the, thro of the throne of God. Verse 3, consider him who endured this opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary, you will not lose heart. Father, open our eyes. Give us a handle to grip the next time we feel a little tired, a little weak, a little weary. And Father, give us encouragement to keep on. Have you lost your enthusiasm for the Christian life? Do you feel like sometimes you just don't want to serve anymore? You're tired of giving? You're tired, tired of pursuing God in your life? I remember some weekends when I was preaching down at Mandarin, uh, second, third, fourth time I'd preach that sermon a weekend, and I'd get ready to walk up on the platform, and I just didn't feel like I wanted to be there. I didn't feel worthy to be there. It might have been a time when in my personal life I was struggling with some worries about family or finances, and I just didn't feel like I had anything to say. I've experienced what you also understand, that the Christian life sometimes is, is tough. And sometimes we get tired of just keeping on. And we also have an enemy who is whispering always, don't take it so seriously. You know, coast a little bit. One of my favorite quotes comes from Wilbur Reese. Tongue-in-cheek, he said, I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. What I want to say to you today is be faithful, even if you don't feel like it. And the Hebrew writer is writing to people who need that message. They're Christians. They're looking over their shoulders. They're thinking, did we make a mistake about Jesus? Is there something better than this? Do we have to keep on keeping on? And the Hebrew writer says, not only is Jesus better than anything else, he's the best there is. And here's why. So then and today, I think we need this word. I think it helps us when the flame of faith that once just roared within us, you remember the first love? Remember the mountaintop experiences? Well, we don't live on the mountaintops. We live in the valleys. And when the flame begins to flicker just a little bit, we need a word from God that says you can make it. You can learn how to keep your joy. You can learn how to keep on with enthusiasm over the long haul. You can learn how to keep on trucking. There's the old story about the man that had the sick mule called the vet. The vet examined him and said, yeah, he's sick. Here's what you do. You give him one of these white pills. These are miracle drugs. Give it to him. He'll get well. I've seen it happen over and over. And if perchance he doesn't, I think he will. But if he doesn't, then and only then you give him one of these red pills. Okay, doc. A couple weeks later, the vet saw the farmer and he said, how's your mule? He said, doc, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. I gave him that white pill. He jumped up off the floor. He ran out of the barn, jumped over the fence, took off down the road into the woods. If I hadn't had the presence of mind to take that little red pill myself, I never would have caught him. <laughs> well, today I'm going to give you some red pills. And you can write them down in your notes. We're going to have to go fast, but I've got six points to this sermon, and I know that makes folks nervous when a preacher's got six points to his sermon. But let's look what we can get from these three verses of Scripture. And I think you can keep on trucking even when the fires of your faith burn a little low. First of all, know some history. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we can be encouraged by the saints who have gone before us. A couple of weeks ago, O.S. Hawking preached here. I listened to his sermon. What a marvelous use of church history. It just seemed to flow from him as he talked about those greats of faith who suffered and struggled and yet were found faithful. The imagery in this, these three verses is athletic competition. It's running a race, but it's a little different than most times. It's common in Scripture, but here there are a couple of things. The therefore points back to chapter 11, and it gives a whole line of faithful saints, men and women who kept on trucking to the end. That's who the therefore says we're to look at. But the other thing that's different is that these people, the Hebrew writer references, aren't on the field of competition any longer. These folks have run their race. They now are in the stands. And the picture you're to get here as you read these verses is to think of them, Moses and Amos and Rahab, Noah, Jake, so many who are in the stands, and they're cheering for you to run hard. They're cheering for you to keep going. I found this little cartoon character. It looks kind of like Abraham would look, don't you think, if he were trucking? And can you imagine... Abraham shouting his encouragement to you, keep at it, you can make it. We did, you can too. Look at the people in that list. Jacob, this Jacob, wasn't very dependable. Had a little problem with his character. Uh, I doubt that you'd hire him for your business. He wouldn't be your best friend of choice. In fact, if you lived next door to him, you'd probably lock your garage door every night. But Jacob is in the list. He says, I know what it's like to feel guilty. But you hang in there. I did. Moses. Everybody knows Moses. Moses is in the list, but Moses didn't want to serve God. In fact, Moses made excuses. He complained. He said, Lord, I'm not your guy. But God put a rod in his hand, and you know the story. And Moses is in those stands, and he says, I know how you feel when you don't want to get involved. You want to stay on the sidelines. I know what it feels like to, to feel inadequate. But hang in there. You can do it. A lot more than you think. Just keep at it. Rahab the prostitute is in there. And she's shouting her encouragement. What would she have to say to us? I think she would say, you think you're a sinner? You should have seen me. I mean, I was a really bad person, but God saved me. He redeemed me. And even if you feel as bad as I was, you keep going. John Gresham wrote a book called Bleachers. And in the book, he talks about some high school football players that are back in their glory place where everything happened when they were high school kids. Their coach is passing away. They've come to, uh, to be there for him. And they go out to the bleachers of the stadium. They're sitting there and they're reminiscing and all the heroes and the scoundrels and the stories. And in the telling of the story, there are a couple of times where it seems their imaginations begin to soar and they can actually hear the roar of the crowd again. Christian, sometimes when you're quiet, you ought to be able to hear the cheers of the saints of heaven. We are surrounded by them. You see, we don't serve God in a vacuum. Your Christian life isn't about here and now, this slice of time and this location. Get some historical perspective. Know what you're a part of. A great heritage of faith. And I'm not just talking about ancient Old Testament history either. You know, some of the greatest motivations of my life that I draw on when I'm at my lowest happened just a few years ago. In fact, when my wife and I retired from preaching ministry, we started CORE because of three little kids that we met in India. First time we traveled outside continental United States was to India. We flew into Delhi, and from Delhi, we finally got on a train 18 hours down to the Mo, mid-India, and we saw poverty like I have never imagined it existed in our day. It's everywhere. I mean, not just a few, it's everywhere. And it breaks your heart. You find yourself kind of shielding yourself from You can't process it. You can't do anything about it. So you begin, after a day or two, just kind of shut it out. I've learned since then some statistics. I've learned that 7 billion people in the world, a billion people live in extreme poverty. That's defined as a dollar a day or less. A dollar a day, that's not 
You don't hope. You don't dream. That's an ugly existence. That's trying to figure out how do I stay alive today, literally. It's a terrible thing. I've learned that every five seconds, a child dies in our world from hunger, malnutrition, or disease. Every five seconds, that's poverty. We met three little kids the day we were leaving India. We didn't meet them, actually. We saw them walking down a dusty road, and they were the most pitiful sight we had ever seen in our lives. Seema, at the age of nine, was given responsibility, custodial care of her younger brother and sister because their parents had abandoned them. They were impaired, and often in India, because of the poverty, parents can't take care of the healthy ones. Those who are sickly can't do anything to support the family. Families move away. They're called throwaway kids. It's a common practice. These little kids were on their own. This is a couple years after Seema had been taken care of them. And their skin was diseased, they're albino, they were sight impaired, their skin literally was burned from the Indian sun. They were the most pitiful sight you can imagine. We asked the missionary, do you know those kids? Yeah. We can't help them all, can we help those three? And my wife and I kind of adopted those three kids, and not very much, a very few American dollars. And those kids today have graduated high school. They're working, two of them, in the mission. One, the boy, Siraj, is working in construction. They're healthier. They see better. And these three little kids, when I start feeling sorry for myself, all I do is think of Seema, Chanda, Suraj, and they motivate me. That's why we're in, India, or in Haiti. Eighty percent of the Haitian rural population lives in extreme poverty. A couple other things motivate me. Last November, I think it was, when we came to Crossroads, that missions conference you had was the most incredible night Brendan and I have ever spent. And we recall that with such fondness. And just a few months ago, a group from your church, your college kids, came down to Haiti on a missions trip. And everybody said, you know, those kids from Crossroads, they're great. Anything you ask them to do, they not only do it, but they do it with great attitude. And they sponsored a soccer tournament, first one. And it was supposed to be kind of for kids, as I understand it, but the Haitian adults took it over, and they were so excited. I got a phone call that said, this tournament's turned into something. Can we give cash prizes? Well, we don't do handouts at all. And I said, you know what? Let's don't do that. But what do we do? We've got farmers that are raising chicken and selling them. Let's buy some chicken from our farmers. And so your kids passed out trophies to the winners. Second place winners got a chicken. First place winners got two chickens, and you got pictures of them handing them out. <laughs> and I've told that story. They're great. I've told that story a lot of times. Every time I do, it brings a smile on my face, thanksgiving in my heart, and it motivates me. Know your history. Things that have happened, recall them, replay them. Let them encourage you. Number two, learn from mistakes. If you figured out that God will use your disobedience more than your obedience to shape and train you, struggling with disobedience makes us stronger. That's my personal testimony. The best lessons I have learned have been the most painful from my most embarrassing blunders. The verse says, let's throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that easily entangles us, and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. A runner who wants to win will wear some weights around his legs. Why? Because when he is in the actual race, he takes them off and he flies like, I mean, just, you know, you feel like you're weightless. Brendan and I went to a horse show last Saturday night. Tennessee Walker National Celebration, the biggest Tennessee Walker horse in the uh, show in the world. Huge stadium. Used to be standing room only. You couldn't get tickets to get in there. It was nearly empty. Now, when those horses line up around the track and the ringmaster says, ladies and gentlemen, let them walk on out, and a Hammond organ begins to play, and those horses begin to prance and that hinged movement of their hoofs, it is a sight to behold. But the national newspapers this week said that's probably the last one, 76 years in a row. Why? because a practice called soaring was made public. That was a dirty little secret. What they did is they did some things to the hooves of the horses to train them. And everybody knew it was painful to the horses, but you had to do that to get that gait. But it became widely publicized 
and they tried to legislate against it. People tried to sneak and do it anyway. And because they wouldn't throw the weight off, literally, and that sport is almost dead. It's almost gone. You see, when there's a weight, a sin in your life, you can't say, well, that's just who I am. Well, that's my weak spot. I'm, I'm sowing some wild oats. I, I can't do anything about it. You must do something about it. You have to throw it off. You don't do that accidentally. You do it on purpose. The Bible's pretty realistic. Hebrews is written to Christians, and the Bible doesn't whitewash them. It assumes that, as you read here, you'll know that he's writing to people who are entangled in sin. They're being hindered by their sins, just like people in this room. If we don't identify our mistakes, if we don't throw them off, they will destroy us. It's one of the reasons I think your pastor has led you in a direction of connect ministry, small group ministry. And I commend you as a church because you had a successful Wednesday night service when hardly anybody else does in America. And to leave that to go to something else is hard to do. And I commend you for this reason because your church is big enough now that you could easily become institutionalized. That simply means stuck where you are. You don't change easily. That's our Sunday school room. That's our coffee pot. Don't make us change. We're not going to do it. But I understand that you've made that transition with enthusiasm, and you have a sign up today, and I commend you for signing up for it. And here's why. In this big group today, I don't see anybody that looks particularly entangled by sin. We got our Sunday faces on, don't we? But we know in our heart of hearts that we're flawed. We know our own sins. We're flawed people who need relationships that are strong enough, trustworthy enough, reliable enough that somebody can hold us accountable for our sin. We need somebody who's willing to help us learn what we must learn from our sins, not hide them, not keep them secret. And that's risky. And the only way you would ever take advantage of that kind of help is if you invest enough in other people that trust builds in that relationship. If you're in this church and you don't have anybody you're close enough to who will hold you accountable for your mistakes, you're in a dangerous place. You're weighted down. And your flame of faith will grow dim. So get connected. Ask God to reveal the weights that you carry around and ask for his grace to allow you to throw them off and you fly like the wind. Here's the next one. Make good choices. We all have a choice in our behavior. And our choices that please God are essential if we're going to persevere. Let's run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus. Now the word looking is interesting. There's a specific Greek word here. It's not just kind of looking in general. There are other Greek words for that. This looking is a word that says I'm going to look specifically at something and away from all the other distractions. Hebrew writer is saying you choose to look at Jesus. That's who you look to. That's how you get help and encouragement. Have you ever wondered why our culture is becoming so irresponsible? Common sense seems to have gone out the window. I started just kind of thinking of the things that I could name that our government has decided to do for us in the last few years. The list got so long I couldn't even go to it because I, one thing for sure, I went to Denver this past summer, happened to be the same weekend they were having the, some kind of national celebrate marijuana weekend. And when I came back after my meeting to the airport, it was packed with festival celebrants, let's say. <laughs> I was hoping my pilot wasn't one of them, you know, first. But I looked around the room at the people that were there, and what I saw made me wonder who in their right minds thought that this was a good idea, made the choice to make this decision makes no sense. It's like the guy that was sitting on a tack, obviously uncomfortable. The preacher said to him in an effort to help, well, you need to pray, read your Bible, then you'll be able to handle the pain. The Freudian psychologist says you were potty trained horribly and the emotional trauma is causing the pain you feel. The doctor recommended an ointment, gave him a prescription. Finally, a little kid came along and said, hey, mister, why don't you get up off that tack? 
I mean, that's a common sense choice, isn't it? Those are the choices that we have. I've learned that people are what they decide to be. Now, I'm not talking about folks who have issues beyond their control. I know that there are emotional, medical realities beyond personal control, but I am saying an awful lot of the problems that we accept are there because we've chosen to let them stay. In other words, I've seen people that I think have chosen depression. I'm going to be depressed. Well, how can you say that, Dennis? Here's why. Because I've seen people when the payback of depression, manipulation, self-pity, whatever it is, becomes less than the pain of depression, I've seen people choose to change. The Hebrew writer is simply saying, choose to look at Jesus. No matter what else is going on, choose to look at Jesus. And you make that personal choice to look at him. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit sometimes kind of mysterious to us, but when you became a Christian, the Bible says you received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit of God. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does is to lean against our will, to help us make decisions by doing what? His testimony is of Jesus. He says, look at Jesus. Know how much Jesus loves you. Concentrate on Jesus and then make good choices. I'm not much of a counselor, not a gift of mine, really. I did it when I had to, but I did it with questions. People would come in and sit in my office, and I'd sit down after a little bit. I'd say, well, what do you think your problem is? And almost all the time, people could tell me what their problem was. They could, right there, they had it. And I'd say, well, what do you think you ought to do about it? And again, almost every time, people knew the path they needed to walk to solve the problem. Now, there was pride, selfishness, all those kinds of things, but they knew how to solve the problem. I'd say, well, that sounds good to me. Let's pray. And then I'd send them out my door. I gave them a book, Happiness is a Choice, and I'd make them promise to read it. And you know what? Most of those folks, when I sent them out, they were on their way to full recovery. Why? Because I was a great counselor? No. Because they had made a logical choice toward a different behavior. Listen, Christian, one of the great dignities that God has given to you is the freedom, the responsibilities of choice. We can choose to focus on problems, or we can choose to focus on solutions. You can choose in your church on criticisms or compliments. You can see nothing but gripers around you, or you can see praisers. And I guarantee you'll find what you're looking for. And the strength of the flame of faith in you is tied directly to your choices. Here's number four, get some encouragement from God. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. We have a phrase in Haiti that we use, hope changes everything. We work with people that have a hope of heaven, but nothing at all on this earth. We have used and taken for granted this morning things they don't even know about, dream about. It's not in their hope category. But when these folks get a chicken business and they sell two or three, four hundred chickens in a six-week period of time, and they sell them, they've got more money in their hands than they've had in the last eight, ten months together. And they begin to get a little hope of economic development. When a guy that was raising a handful of tomatoes for his wife to sell along a road is raising hundreds of pounds of tomatoes now, and he sells them, and there's a little hope of economic development. Hope changes everything. And you see, God gives us hope and encouragement. And what the Hebrew writer is saying is that when you're suffering through something, the hope comes in knowing that he's already suffered through that. Let's run with endurance the race set before us. And it talks about Jesus, how he endured the cross and how he despised, but he accepted the shame of the cross. Turn back to chapter 4. It talks about our high priest. He said he's not one unaware of our weaknesses, but he's tempted in every way like we are. And the reason he went through that is so that you can come to him in confidence and know that he'll help you in your time of need. That's what it says in verse 25. And what that means to me is Jesus did it before you did it so he can help you when you're going through it. Jesus has already been there. No matter what you have experienced, Jesus, at all points tempted like us, sympathizes with our weaknesses. doesn't matter what you face. Is it selfishness? Is it fear? Is it the disloyalty of a friend? I don't like that one. 
I, I like loyalty. People who betray me, I don't like that. I've got some Scotch. There's a, an old Scotch poem that says, uh, may those who love me love me. Those who don't love me, may God turn their hearts. And if God doesn't turn their hearts, may turn their ankles and I'll know them by their limp. <laughs> you know, that's the way I feel about them. Maybe you're lonely, tempted. Jesus said, I understand all of that. I've been there myself. Life is hard. No exceptions for you because you're a Christian. Life is hard, but God is faithful. His love endures forever, and he will see you through. Number five, take God at his word. Do you know that the Bible is full of promises? You know that, don't you? Do you also know that those promises are just as dependable as God is? If God is God and he makes a promise, he can keep it, and you can count on it. And the promise here is that God is aggressively working out your perfection. What God has begun in you will become a reality, the Bible says. In other words, the fact of its beginning is the promise of its completion. Now think about that. That's what the Bible said. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, perfecter of our faith. Jesus takes our faith and perfects it. I'll admit, I don't know how that works. I don't know how he does that. I just take him at his word. Philippians 1, 6, this is what it says. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. There's some days I don't feel too perfect. In fact, most days I don't feel perfect at all. I have a desire to please God. I want to keep on trucking, but I know my flesh. It's weaker than I want to admit. But in those days, here's what I've chosen to hear. And I, I think you ought to write this down in your Bible, mark it, you ought to memorize it. First John chapter 3, verse 2. I personalize it. You can do the same thing. It does not yet appear what Dennis Bratton shall be. But when he comes, Jesus, the day of Jesus Christ, when he comes, Dennis Bratton will be just like him. We live in a fallen world right now. Things may be really bad in your life. I hope they're not. But if they are, this isn't all there is. Jesus is working for you. Jesus is going to bring all things together for good. Take God at his word. And then finally, expect royal privilege. Looking to Jesus who sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Have you heard the old saying, the king's bounty belongs to the king's family? I think this scripture is incredible. It's, it's simple. One, two, three. Number one, Jesus is sitting next to God. And that's a metaphor, by the way. It means that Jesus has all the authority of the universe. Jesus is next to God at his right hand. Number two, Jesus is family. He's your elder brother. And number three, the reason Jesus is seated next to God is he is talking to the Father about you. Chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus is able to save completely those who have come to God through him because he always lives, Jesus lives forever, to intercede for you. That means when the flame is flickering low, when you're discouraged, Jesus is sitting next to God, talking to him, telling him about you. He loves you so much, he won't stop talking about you. And so here's the so what today. I want to close with this. Every sermon has three steps, to know, to feel, to do. Do you know that? I think every preacher tries to accomplish this. Here's something from God's Word I want you to know about. Mine's Hebrews chapter 12, the first three verses. And to feel, I want you to feel some kind of draw to that scripture, to that truth, so that you'll take the final step and do something with it. And here's specifically what I want to ask you to do. Before this day is over, I'm going to ask every man, woman, and child here to take time, get off in a corner by yourself, and memorize these three verses. Memorize them. You can do it. Memorize them. Why? Because the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. How do you hide the word in your heart? Well, you memorize it. So you memorize these three verses. And then the Holy Spirit, the gift in you that leans against your will, the next time you're about to stumble, the next time the weight has entangled you and you just are about to fall, you're going to give up, you're going to quit, 
The next time that happens, the Holy Spirit can draw up what you've invested in your mind, what you've hidden in your heart, and He can bring these words to your mind. Keep on. Don't give up. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Throw off the things that are hindering you. Run the race with endurance. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. The joy set before him caused him to endure the cross, to endure its shame, to sit down then at the right hand of God, and then listen, consider him. He endured this treatment from sinful men so that you will not grow weary. You will not lose heart. That's what Jesus did. <laughs> so that you can keep on trucking. Would you pray with me?